Welcome to AP World Simplified. Today we're going to be discussing the origins of the early state as well as some of the earlier civilizations of the Neolithic, Bronze, and Iron Ages. Following the population growth of the Neolithic era, no longer would the old ways of organizing society in the Paleolithic era work. There were too many people with this population growth, too many people to be familiar with and to trust. So the old bonds of kinship and chieftains would no longer be adequate for functioning in these Neolithic societies, whether they were permanent settlements or pastoral societies. What would instead be required in the Neolithic era is a much more sophisticated form of organizing society. This is known today as the state or the government. This is a case where there are too many people to be familiar with or trust. So a sense of hierarchy and law and order must be established established to maintain uh, proper behavior in society, to assure that people are generally safer than they would be otherwise, and to uh, promote affluence in your society so that it grows rather than shrinks or falls victim to a neighboring society. Now, as mentioned in the previous video, most of the powerful positions in these societies are going to be run by males. Uh, and the hierarchy is going to look like generally as follows, with some exceptions, such as the Indian subcontinent. You're going to have generally at the top a king or an emperor, followed by the priestly class, followed by soldiers, followed by artisans being farmers, merchants whatever and and the very bottom you would have either slaves or potentially peasants which is a form of corvée labor that we'll discuss later in the course now the people at the tops of these hierarchies the kings the priests and soldiers they were in charge of providing defense they were in charge of organizing the layout of the city such as maybe the canals or the roads the buildings the walls whatever uh, and keeping the, the society generally organized, functional, and safe. That was their primary objective. Um, another thing that was really characteristic of these early hierarchies in these early states was the set of rules was often not what we're so much used to nowadays. Nowadays, we're used to rules that apply to everybody roughly equally. And if you're tried for a crime, you get somewhat of a fair trial based on evidence and jury, etc. Back then, it wasn't so much the case. The way the rules functioned was you benefited highly if you were near the top of the hierarchy and you had far more rules and consequences the lower you were in that hierarchy. As a general comparison, a king or a priest had very few or no rules that governed their lives, whereas a, a regular person or a slave had far more rules along with, with a lot more harsh punishments for those rules. And again, what that did was it maintained and enforced the current uh, hierarchy while also providing some law and order for the entire hierarchy and making the society better generally as a whole. Most of the early states would reside in cities. These were known as city-states. States that were run by a king or whoever was at the top, and these this group, this state, was, was sovereign in that city, in that they had control of what was going on in the city and not so much outside of it. Those are city-states. When city-states start conquering other city-states and adding them into their uh, control, that's known as an empire. So the early beginnings in the Neolithic era, uh, it is primarily going to be dominated by these city-states uh, competing and defending against one another, and the real empire building is going to start more so in the Bronze Age, which begins roughly in around 33 or 3200 BCE. And most of these early what we call river valley civilizations are going to start developing in these fertile river valleys. And when they learn to harness the power of, of metals such as bronze as opposed to stone, which is that marker that separates the Neolithic era from the Bronze and later Iron Age, that's going to give them a substantial advantage going forward, and it's going to allow them to, as city-states, start conquering and incorporating other city-states. And we're going to start seeing the beginnings of what are early empires. Now, the six primary River Valley civilizations you want to know for the AP World Test are going to be the Shang Dynasty in the Yellow River, the Indus Valley River Civilization, the Mesopotamian River Valley Civilizations, uh, the Nile River with Egypt. You're also going to want to know the Mesoamerican uh, civilizations such as Olmec, and in the Andes region, uh, the uh, city-states uh, or the river valley civilization of Chauvin. Now while most of these river valleys are going to function similarly, which things such as how their hierarchy is established or how they use religion to justify that hierarchy, most of these river valleys are going to have some distinguishing cultural characteristics. And what I mean by cultural is um, it could mean anything from architecture to dress to religion to language to poetry to song, whatever it is that's a defining sort of invention or characteristic of that particular era area. So for the Egyptians, for example, their defining architecture is going to be clearly the pyramids, as many of you remember probably from your junior high and elementary school history classes. 
And in Mesopotamia, you're gonna have less known but equally cool looking uh, ziggurats, which are essentially like step pyramids with temples or palaces at the top, usually at the center of these city-states that are surrounded by walls. Now in other areas such as the Indus Valley civilizations, you're going to have not so much defining architectural pieces, but innovative and defining layouts, such as the town of Harappa, which is going to position their city in a way, in their buildings, uh, to catch the wind to function as a sort of AC, as well as developing sewers that other civilizations do not develop for hundreds if not thousands of years. Additionally, in the Americas, in the Olmec and Chauvin region, you're going to have not so much that defining architecture. Uh, you will have, of course, of course, the iconic stone heads of the Olmec civilizations, but you're going to have an innovative form of agriculture in the form of terracing, which is utilizing hills that can usually not be used to grow plants on. And what they'll, they do is they level off almost like steps on these hills so that you can actually utilize the hills of the Andes Mountains or in the upper parts of Mesoamerica uh, for farming. Additionally, in the American, Mesoamerican and uh, Andes regions, they're going to harness the power of intercropping, which is essentially taking crops that have to be distanced somewhat based on roots and sunlight and things, and using that space in between uh, to plant smaller or different crops that either use different nutrients or require less sun sunlight or whatever, and that's gonna allow them to use utilize their land better and increase their uh, food supply as well as their population. Now, as these city-states begin to harness more of these agricultural techniques, architecture, and innovations such as metallurgy, that's gonna give them advantages over other city-states and allow them to uh, conquer and incorporate these city-states within their empires. Now, these first wave of empires taking place in the foundational era, in the Neolithic, uh, Bronze, and Iron Ages, or early Iron Age, I should say, these are going to be known as uh, first wave empires because they're not nearly as organized as the ones that characterize the second wave empires of period two, the classical era, which will be uh, in, in the next couple videos. These civilizations are going to conquer people uh, and pillage their city-state, take many as slaves, force them to pay tribute. Essentially, they're not very nice rulers of these areas. That's gonna leave them fairly unstable and allow these city-states that have been conquered uh, to just wait for opportunities to either rebel or join some sort of um, movement against the current empire. One of the best regions that demonstrates this is during the Bronze Age in Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, you had many empires rise and fall, all within a span of about 2,000 years, including the empire starting from the city-state of Uruk, uh, and with the Sumerian Empire, uh, the Akkadian Empire, uh, invaders from what is modern-day Turkey or Anatolia, um, the Hittites, you're gonna have the uh, Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, lots of these city-state-based empires that would grow, expand, conquer, and incorporate other city-states States um, at the expense, of course, of the lives and goods of the people they conquered. Now, what allowed these certain city-states to have advantage over others is usually based on resources. So having more people, having more efficient metals, like for example, the Hittites were some of the early forerunners in the development of iron, and that gave them a distinct advantage over the bronze and stone weapons uh, and armor of their opponents. Now, as these city-states and empires began to gather more and more stuff, and kings, elites, and others began to acquire more wealth, land, and power, it became harder and harder and harder for human memory to track exactly what they had. So what we have in Egypt and early Mesopotamia in roughly the late 4th millennia BCE is the beginnings of written language for the purposes of tracking uh, what trade goods what goods they owned and what goods were traded and what goods they received. So while it's not going to be developed in the sense that they can communicate perfectly their spoken language, we're gonna have the earliest forms of written symbols that represent words. And these early symbols that represent words are gonna be seen in the form of cuneiform in Mesopotamia and hieroglyphics uh, in Egypt. Earlier alphabets are gonna be more or less developed by the Phoenicians, but that's not until a little bit after uh, the symbols of the hieroglyphics and the uh, cuneiform of the Mesopotamia. Mesopotamians. It's also during the Bronze Age that we're going to see the beginnings of the first written law, law that applies uh, to everybody. Now, I'm not saying it's equal for everybody because it's clearly not going to be at this time, but it is going to be applicable to all people within that city, state, or empire. So a couple of the earlier examples are going to be the codes of ur and the codes of Hammurabi, uh, as seen in early Mesopotamia. And those are going to pop up around the year 2100 BC and 1750 BCE, uh, so near the mid and later parts of the Bronze Bronze Age before the Bronze Age collapse. Now with the Bronze Age collapse in roughly the 12th century BC, we're going to be seeing the beginnings of the Iron Age, which is of course defined mostly by the casting and use of iron, specifically uh, carbon steel, 
And that goes to about, at least in the Middle East, about the year 5-ish, 5-ish, 500-ish BCE, when the Persian Empire emerges. And the reason why we cut the Iron Age here is not that we start stop using iron and carbon steel. It's that we are going to start tracking our own history officially at this point. So the Iron Age goes roughly from the beginning of the use of carbon steel to the era in which we start tracking our own history. Now, what's really going to define the laws and hierarchies of these Bronze and Iron Age civilizations is they're going to use religion to enforce and justify their own power. And what I mean by that is in places like Mesopotamia, for example, gods are going to be seen as communicating to the king and the king carrying out their desires. That's known as a steward of the god. So in that case, the ruler gets their power and direction from the gods, and if they're not doing their job, then bad things will happen to your civilization, be it flood, famine, disease, invasion, whatever it may be. And if they're doing their job, then things will be going relatively well. That's similar to the setup that they're going to have in China. That's known as the Mandate of Heaven. Now, the Mandate of Heaven is going to be a concept developed by the Tzu Dynasty of the 11th century BCE. When the Tzu conquered the Shang Dynasty, they had to have a reason for overthrowing these imperial emperors that they were believed connected with uh, the gods themselves in order to convince the people that they were justifyingly uh, ruling over them. So the Mandate of Heaven is essentially the concept that as long as the ruler is ruling benevolently and is maintaining social harmony, providing protection and support to his people, his or her people, then you have the mandate of heaven. Essentially, things will go well for your country, your empire, your dynasty, and you will maintain a harmonious relationship with your population. However, if you lose the mandate of heaven, let's say you're not being a benevolent or just ruler, you're exploiting the poor, whatever it is that you're doing, bad things will happen to your country. You will experience famines, floods, droughts, invasions, and other things of that sort. And finally, we have a direct divine connection with the ruler. In Egypt, for example, the pharaoh is going to be seen as as an actual deity. And that is one of the reasons why these vast um, elaborate tombs are going to be granted to these pharaohs because they are seen as, at least at that time, gods upon earth or the divine on earth. And that's really going to justify the power uh, for those people ruling you. Whether they're deities on earth in the form of pharaohs or they're stewards of the god as they are in Mesopotamia or they're uh, emperors utilizing or holding the mandate of heaven in China, they are using the heavens uh, to justify their power in that they're doing the bidding or they are themselves uh, the beings from heaven. That's going to conclude it for today's video on AP World Simplified. Next video, we're going to be talking about uh, early religions, trade, and migration paths of the Neolithic, Bronze, and Iron Age peoples. And don't forget, if you're interested in other tools that can help out AP students or teachers for world history, be sure to check out my website at morganapteaching.com. Thanks for watching.